Hello, students. I'm going to take you on an adventure of neurotechnology that you've never been on before. I will teach you things you haven't learned before. I will give you problems, solutions, journeys. I am Andrew Kingston, an expert in neurotechnology. You know, as we look into the future these days, we see many things on the horizon. One of the main things is neurotechnology. Now, neurotechnology, what you're going to be doing when you're talking about is the brain. So all up in here, the head area. Now, when you're looking at the brain, there's many things you can look at. Because the brain controls many things. It controls your breathing, your heart, your thoughts, everything. The brain is even in, isn't even fully understood yet. Scientists are still working on it. So when you talk about neurotechnology, even the most advanced stuff is still very limited stuff. The first category we're going to be talking about today is obviously neurotechnology, but implant something in the brain to help amputees. Now, oftentimes, whether it be in a war or a serious car accident, people will lose an arm or a leg or even more than one. Now, as these people come back, oftentimes they will just be implanted with a simple little device that, if they're lucky, can maybe grasp an object for a few seconds. With advancements in neurotechnology, however, scientists are being able to attach stuff to the bone. So they will attach it through the skin to the bone, and once this happens, they can stick transmitters in the head and back down in the arms that will work like nerves to where they can feel things, but also to where they can actually regain almost a better motion, to where they can grasp things longer than their fingers, right, and open coke cans and such. Fingers, right, the problem with this is that it won't work. Now, another thing that they're doing with neurotechnology these days is they have the ability to patients that have lost the use of their limbs through paralysis, being hit by a car swing, um, what they can do is they can physically go into surgery and implant something into the patient's head, kind of like a giant microchip type thing. Now what happens is, as this microchip, it comes into their head, it gives them the ability to be able to move a mouse that is on the computer. They can move the mouse by just using their brain waves. So, if, they, if they're paralyzed, they can draw stuff on the computer. Now, it doesn't work exactly, but it's a step. A step for people that are paralyzed to be able to control in their limbs. Another advancement in the field of neurotechnology has been, from a strange place at that, the Food and Drug Administration. Now what they've been able to do is they've been able to take this thing called the Andra Ososcillating Field Simulation Field Simulation Device and what they're going to do is they're going to implant it, literally implant to people's and what it can do is it'll be able to detect injuries and stuff in spinal cord victims. Like once it's inside of their spinal cord what they will be able to do is they can look at it, test the stuff and the whole goal of this is that the people with spinal cord injuries like if you're paralyzed or even half paralyzed just even have like a broken spine in the back from an accident, they can look at that and use those to help repair it much, much faster than they would have ever been able to before. A problem with um, having spinal cord injuries in the spine is if the people were relying heavily on neurotechnology and chips implanted to where they can connect their brain to their back to basically heal them much, much quicker, the chances are that if anything happened to one of these things, they would be permanently injured. So if you were you rely on this fully to heal you and not relying on your natural process, one mistake in that could permanently paralyze you. Now the next thing we have for neurotechnology on this list of list is the fact of now we've talked about how the brain can control the spinal cord, how the brain can control the limbs that are implanted and other things. The next thing we're going to talk about is how the brain can control the muscles. Now, whenever you, wherever you're lifting or working out or running, just exercising, you're using your muscles. We don't think about it, but your brain has to control every one of these individual muscles. There's like over 200 of them or something like that, something like that, something like that. So now, what happens when you start losing your muscles? Well, there's this guy who's got Lou Gehrig's disease, and what that does is what it does, it takes over the brain and it starts weakening your muscles to confine him to a wheelchair and confines most people to a wheelchair. 
Now what the doctors have been able to do is they took a little neurochip the size of a penny, just a penny, and planted it on the back of his head, right, in top, right on top of his brain. And what it's been able to do is it's been able to give his muscles, not their full strength, but enough strength to get him to walk a little and do daily activities. Where if he just had to sit there in a wheelchair for a while, now he can get up and walk around, open a bottle or something like that. He can just do normal everyday activities. Well, the problem we have with this is that, once again, considering that the entire body is controlled by a microchip, which is in essence a computer, you're basically has your mind, but you don't. You can have your mind to think, but you can't control your body. So, as soon as this little microchip fails, your whole body is useless to you. Now, the final thing on our list of lists is, um, Sony, what they have done is they figured out, or they're trying to figure out, how to implant little chips in your brain to where when you're playing video games, like PS3 or Xbox, if it wouldn't be called out, of course, in the future, what you'll be able to do is, while you're playing, instead of having the remote control vibrate, when a bomb goes off, maybe your head vibrates. Well, they send a signal to the brain that makes you vibrate. Or like, if a smoke bomb goes off, they'll implant a little thing in your nasal to make you smell smoke. Now, this is really good if you want a really lifelike visual experience. And that's the key that they're going for here, so it's not really going to be available for a while. Now, the problem with this realistic gameplay where you can really sense what's in the game by using your senses other than your eyes will be the problem that um, young children are going to be playing these very violent video games and then they'll, their brain will be saying to them, you're really there because they will know they're not, but they'll be seeing it and they'll be hearing it and feeling it and sensing it, with their nose especially, their ears also. That could be bad because you get all these war veterans who come back with post-traumatic war stress and other things like that to where they're emotionally unsound. They're just scared. They have comebacks to that in their mind all the time. If we have a bunch of 10 year olds running around with this, that could be pretty bad for our society. Because that would just mean that a bunch of 10 year olds growing up their whole lives would have post traumatic worship where they would be mentally unsound. They would be unstable their entire lives. I'd like to personally thank you for joining me on this adventure inside the wonders of neurotechnology. This has been Sciences, Sciences in Neurotechnology with Matthew Klingstead. I look forward to seeing you soon.